Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to read an essay called Variations on the Theme of Liminality by Victor Turner. Here we go. Liminality is a concept borrowed from the Belgian folklorist Arnold van Gennep, which like a pebble I toss speculatively which, like a pebble, I tossed speculatively into the pool of my anthropological data about a dozen years ago to try to make more sense than I had previously been able to do of ritual processes I had observed in Central Africa. Since then, it has been spreading rings in my work and, through, and thought over wider ranges of data drawn not only from pre-industrial societies but also from complex, large-scale civilizations. My theoretical focus has correlatively shifted from societies in which rituals involve practically everyone to societies in which, as Durkheim puts it, the domain of religion, if not perhaps of ritual, has contracted, become a matter of individual choice rather than universal corporate ascription, and where, with religious pluralism, there is sometimes a veritable supermarket of religious wares. In these societies, symbols once central to the mobilization of ritual action have tended to migrate directly or in disguise through the cultural division of labor into other domains, aesthetics, politics, law, popular culture, and the like. We will briefly examine liminality, what Van Gennep meant by it, and how I have elaborated this formulation. Van Gennep examined the rites of passage in many cultures and found them to have basically a tripartite processual structure, even when they have many isolable episodes. He defines rites to passage as rites which accompany every change of place, state, social position, and age. I will use state as a metonym for other terms. It refers to any type of stable or recurrent condition that is central, culturally recognized. These rites of transition, says Van Gennep, are marked by three phases. Separation, margin, or limin, and re-aggregation. The first and last speak for themselves. They detach ritual subjects from their old places in society and return them inwardly transformed and outwardly changed to new places. A more interesting problem is provided by the middle, marginal, or liminal phase. It is interesting in itself, but more so perhaps on account of its implications for the general theory of social cultural processes. The term marginal has been preempted by various sociologists, for example, Stonequist, Thomas Sakeny, and Reisman, for their own purposes so we are left with liminal. A limin is a threshold, but at least in the case of protracted initiation rites of major or major seasonal festivals, it is a very long threshold, a corridor almost, or a tunnel, which may indeed become a pilgrim's road, or passing from dynamics to statics, may cease to be a mere transition and become a set way of life, a state, that of the anchorite, or monk. Let us refer to the state and process of mid-transition as liminality, and consider a few of its very odd properties. Those undergoing it, call them liminaries, are betwixt and between established states of political dural structure. They evade ordinary cognitive classification too, for they are neither this nor that, here nor there, one thing nor the other. Out of the mundane structural context, they are in a sense dead to the world, and liminality has many symbols of death. Novices may be classed with spirits or ancestors or painted black. In Central Air Africa, the place of circumcision in, in the boys' initiation rites is called the place of dying. They are, also, they are also polluting, as Mary Douglas might say, because they transgress, because they transgress classificor classificatory boundaries. Sometimes they are identified with feces. Usually they are allowed to revert to nature by letting their hair and nails grow and their bodies get covered with dust. Their structural invisibility may be marked not only by their seclusion from men's eyes, but also by the loss of their preliminal names, by the removal of clothes, insignia, and other indicators of preliminal status that may be required to speak they may be required they may be required to speak in whispers, if at all. They may have to learn a special liminal vocabulary. Normal word order may be reversed or even randomly scrambled. As against these emblems of death or limbo, other symbols and symbolic actions portray gestation, parturation, lactation, weaning. The novices at time may be treated as embryos in a womb, as infants being born, as sucklings, and as weanlings. 
Usually, there are words and phrases which indicate that they are being grown into, new po into a new post-liminal state of being. But the most characteristic mid-liminal symbolism is that of paradox, or being both this and that. Novices are, are portrayed and act as andro androgynous, or as both living and dead, at once ghosts and babes, both cultural and natural creatures, human and animal. They may be said to be in a process of being ground down into a sort of homogenous social matter in which responsibilities of differentiation may be still glimpsed and then later positively refashioned into specific shapes compatible with their new postliminal duties and rights as incumbents of the new status and state. The grinding down process is accomplished by ordeals, circumcision, subincision, clitorolectomy, hazing, endurance of heat and cold, impossible physical tests in which failure is greeted by ridicule, ridicule unanswerable riddles which make even clever candidates look stupid, followed by physical punishments and the like. But reducing down overlaps with reconstruction. The rebuilding process is by instruction partly in practical skills, partly tribal esoterica, and proceeds both by verbal and nonverbal symbolic means. Sacred objects may be shown, myths recited in conjunction with them, answers may be given to riddles earlier left unexplained. Very often masked figures invade the liminal space, usually framed in a sacred enclosure, cave, ten tenemos, or other sequestered site. These masked figures being themselves liminal in their bizarre combinations of human, animal, vegetable, and mineral characteristics. Such maskers and monsters are often composites of factors drawn from the culture of mundane, quotidian experience, but split off from their normal, expectable context and recombined in grotesque, weird, even anatomically impossible configurations, which have at least one of their functions, that of provoking the novices or initians, the liminaries, into thinking hard about the elements and basic building blocks of symbolic complexes they had hereto taken for granted as natural units. Actually, in the liminal state, gives in the liminal state gives way to possibility. Aberrant possibilities reveal once more to liminaries the value of what has hereto here here through to here through to been regarded as somewhat tedious daily round. A man-headed lion leaping in firelight from the bush may make one think about the abstract nature of both human heads and of feral bodies, or the relationship between culture which can manufacture monsters and nature which generates lions, or of the symbolism of social control. A chief has lion-like powers. Each culture will stress its own salient dichotomies and draw its own lessons. And this is one of the simpler monsters. The Chinese dragon, a complex monster indeed, has been claimed by Elliot Smith to be a cultural construct in its entirety. Every part of its body has cosmological significance. The colors and shapes of its eyes, limbs, wings, tail, its scales, its claws, its postures, all derive from the principle of and symbolic lexicon of a cosmological system. Thus, masks and monsters may be much pedi as much pedagogical devices as instruments of coercion through terror and awe. Like other liminal things, they are pos probably both. This, of course, is a synoptic account. Not all pre-industrial societies have protracted rites to passage, and some stress particular themes and symbolic processes and play down others. Here, I wish to show that where transition in space-time is ritualized, how it is ritualized, the nature and properties of the ritual symbols and of their interrelations gives us clues not only to the cherished values of the society that performs the rituals, but also the nature of human sociality itself transcending particular cultural forms. This is not the place to discuss in any detail the distinction between sequestered and public liminality, which roughly corresponds to the difference between initiation rites and major seasonal feasts. In the former, the liminaries are humbled and leveled to make them fit for a higher status, or state in the latter, the, liminal, the liminaries are everybody in the community, and no one is elevated in status at the end of the rites. But by way of compensation, such major rites but by way of compensation, such major rites as sowing and harvest festivals, fi fist fruit festivals, change in season rites, or rites celebrating important points on the sun's ecliptic from northern to southern solstice, very frequently involve symbolic status reversal, or the creation of mock hierarchies for the mundanely poor and humble. 
Humbling and submission to ordeal, whether inflicted by self or others, goes with preparation for elitehood, whether in this world or the next, while having an extremely good time and play-acting at having superior status goes with a basic persisting secular egalitarianism among those who become liminaries for the occasion. Here, another question must be raised. Whatever happened to liminality in post-tribal societies? The answer will involve me in a brief discussion of a set of concepts which may help towards an explanation. These are work, leisure, play, flow, and communitas. I am not in this essay going to use liminality in the metaphorical sense. I'm going to look at cultural phenomena, which may either be shown to have descended from earlier forms of ritual liminality or are in some sense their functional equivalents. Work. In tribal and archaic societies, what people do in ritual is often described by terms which we might translate as work. Raymond Firth speaks of the work of the gods in Tikopia as a native description of the annual ritual cycle of these Polynesians. Bantu-speaking peoples in Africa use the same term for a ritual specialist's activity or as for what a hunter, a cultivator, a headman, or today a manual laborer does. Our own terms, liturgy, comes from the Greek laos, or laos, the people, and aragon, work cognate of, as our linguistics here know, well know, of the Old English weork and German work, and ultimately derived from an Indo-European base wergo, to do, act. I could cite many other examples, but the point I wish to make is that the ritual round in, is that the ritual round in tribal societies is embedded in the total round of activities, and is part of the work of the people, which is also the work of the gods. We are dealing with a universe of work in which the whole community participates, as of obligation, not optation. Furthermore, though there are special rights for special categories of persons, and for particular points in the culturally defined life cycle of each person, sooner or later no one is exempt from ritual duty, just as no one is exempt from economic, little, legal, or political obligations. Communal participation, obligation, the passage of the whole society through crises, communal or individual, directly or by proxy, these are the, are the hallmarks of the work of the gods, the sacred human work. Without sacred work, profane human work would be, for the community, impossible to conceive. But, on the other hand, the ritual work to which I am referring is not quite what we, from our stance, from our stance on the hither side of the Industrial Revolution and perhaps the Protestant ethic, might regard as work, for it includes what we might think of as play, or more solemnly, put, or more solemnly put, since Hizuinga the Luddic. Many in many tribal site rites, there is built into the liturgical structure a good deal of what we and they would think of as amusement, recreation, fun, and joking. Furthermore, there is often the actual playing of games, ceremonial lacrosse among North American Indians, for example, the exhausting combined race and ball game of the Taramahara of Mexico, or the push of war contests found among cent West Central Bantu of Africa. Among the maskers are clowns, among the myths, trickster stories. Liminality is particularly conductive to play. Play is not to be restrictive, restricted to games and jokes. It extends to the introduction of new forms of symbolic action, such as word games or masks. In short, parts of liminality may be given over to experimental behavior. I mean here by experiment any action or process undertaken to discover something not yet known, not scientific experimentation, nor what is based in experience, but ra ra nor what is based on experience rather than theory or authority. In liminality, new ways of acting, new combinations of symbols are tried out to be discarded or accepted. Ritual, and particularly liminality, should not be regarded as monolithic. Tribal ritual at any length and complexity is, in fact, an orchestration of many genres, styles, moods, atmospheres, tempi, and so on, ranging from prescribed formal stereotyped action to a free play of inventiveness, including symbols in all the sensory codes mentioned by Levi Strauss, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, kinesthetic, and so on. It has free and formulaic verbal behavior, bodily acts on, of many kinds. The essence of ritual is its multidimensionality, of its symbols, their 
multivocality, merely to equate such ritual with the obsessional rituals of Western neurotics, as Freud did, is to rob it of its creative potentials and of its nuanced interplay through of thought and mood. Ritual multiplicity of elements allows for great flexibility and gives it an immense capacity to portray, interpret, and master radical novelty. This same complex flexibility makes it adaptable to change. I am here referring to tribal ritual, where ritual is the nerve center of cultural sensitivity. But whatever happened to liminality and to the richness, flexibility, and symbolic wealth of tribal ritual? As an adherent to one of the religions of the books, I regret the deliminalization of Christian liturgy, except on rare occasions such as Christmas or Easter, where some liminal sonorities of song and language are allowed to linger. With the delimination with the deliminization seems to have gone the powerful play component. Other religions of the book, too, have regularly stressed the solemn at the expense of the festive. Fairs, fiestas, carnivals exist, of course, but not liturgically. Other major historical religions have fared less badly. Thus, in Vedic India, according to Elaine de Lu, the gods, the Sura and the Deva, who are objects of sacrificial of serious sacrificial ritual, which is the work of the householder Ashram Girishata stage of life, the gods play. The rise, duration, and destruction of the world is their game. Creation is not only the work of the gods, but is also the play of the gods. And ri human ritual is both earnest and playful. Modern bhakti movements still have this spontaneous performative Luddic quality, where Eros sports with Thantos and not the grisly dance macabre, but to symbolize a complete human reality. Leisure. We've spoken of work and play, now let's consider work and leisure. Of recent, years, of, of recent years, much has been written on this pair of concepts. Geoffrey de Manzier has recently argued strongly for the view that true leisure only exists when it comp complements or rewards work. Thus, he refused to classify the idle state of Greek philosophers and 16th century gentry as leisure, since this cannot be defined in relation to work, but rather replaces work altogether, work being done by slaves, peasants, or servants. For Dumanzier, then, leisure presupposes work. It is a non-work, even an anti-work phase in the life of a person who also works. Leisure, he holds, arises under two conditions. One, the first is that society ceases to govern its activity by means of common ritual obligations. Some activities, including those of work and leisure, become, at least in theory, subject to individual choice. And two, secondly, the work by which a person earns his or her living is set apart from his other activities. Its limits are no longer natural, but arbitrary. Indeed, it is organized so in so definite a fashion as it can be easily separated, both in theory and practice, from his free time. Now it is industrial and industrializing societies that we mostly find these conditions. Here work is organized by industry, by clocking in and out, by office hours, and so on, so as to be separated from free time, which includes, of course, in addition to leisure, attendance to such personal needs as eating, sleeping, and caring for one's health and appearance, as well as familial, social, civic, political, and religious obligations. In tribal society, all these would have been parts of the work-play sacred profane continuum and would have been done with substantially the same group of people, not as in industrialized society, with different bunches of each segmental activity spun off by division of labor. Leisure, again, tends to be mainly an urban phenomenon. We see early forms of it perhaps in the 14th century Italian city-state, when, when the concept of leisure begins to penetrate rural societies. This is because agricultural work is tending towards in, an industrial, rationalized mode of organization, and because rural life is being penetrated by urban industrial values. Dumanzier follows Isa Berlin in arguing that leisure has aspects both of freedom from and freedom to. Leisure is freedom from the whole array of institutional obligations prescribed by basic forms of technological and bureaucratic organization in the work domain. It is also freedom from the forced, chronologically regulated rhythms of factory and office, and a chance to recuperate and enjoy natural biological rhythms again on the beaches and mountains, in the parks and game reserves provided as liminoid retreats. 
more positively, it is freedom to enter even even for some to help generate the symbolic worlds of entertainment, sports, games, diversions of all kinds. It is freedom to transcend social structural normative limitations. Freedom indeed to play with ideas, with fantasies, with words. In literature, some of the players have been Rabelais, Joyce, and Samuel Beckett. With paint, think of the pointillisti, surrealist, action painters, and so forth. And with social relationship, new forms of community, mating, sensitivity training, and so on. And now we are getting closer to our lost liminality, for in this modern leisure, far more, than, far more even than in tribal and agrarian rituals, the experimental and Luddic are stressed. There are many more options in complex industrial societies. Games of skill, strength, and chance may serve to, to use Clifford Gertz's terms, both as models of past work experience and models for future work behavior. Football, chess, and mountaineering are undoubtedly exacting and governed by rules and routines at least as stringent as those of the work situation, but being optional, they remain part of the individual's freedom of his growing self-mastery, even self-transcendence, as we shall see when I discuss the notion of flow. They are imbued more thoroughly with pleasure than those many types of industrial work which men are alienated from the fruits and results of their labor. Leisure is thus potentially capable of releasing creative powers, individual and communal, either to criticize or prop up dominant social structural values. This is not the place to discuss the effects of the Protestant ethic and the bureaucratization or even on even the entertainment genres of industrial leisure, making for professionalization of the arts and sports, and giving rise to the notion that art itself is a quasi-religious vocation, with its own asceticism and total dedication, exemplified by Blake, Kierkegaard, Baudelaire, Proust, Rilke, Cézanne, Gauguin, Mahler, Salvius, and so on. Here, I wish to draw attention to some similarities between the leisure genres of art and the entertainment of art and entertainment in complex industrial societies, and the rituals and myths of archaic, tribal, and early agrarian cultures. It is, I suppose, possible to conceive of leisure as a betwixt and between neither this nor that domain between two lodgments in the work domain, or between, on the one hand, occupational and on the other, familial and civic activities. Leisure is derived from the old French lésir, itself derived from Latin lisere, to be permitted. Interestingly enough, Latin comes ultimately, according to Skeet, from the Indo-European base liek, to offer for sale or bargain, referring to the liminal sphere of the market, with its implications of choice, variation, contract, a sphere that has connections in archaic and tribal religions, such as the trickster deities of the Yoruba and Fon Elba and Ishu and the Greek Hermes. Exchange and marketing are more liminal than production, as the focused fantasies of modern commercial advertising still attest. We have now seen how tribesmen play with the factors of liminality, with masks and monsters, symbolic inversions, parodies of profane reality, and so forth. So also do the genres of industrial leisure, theater, ballet, film, the novel, poetry, classical music, rock music, art, pop art, and so on, pulling the elements of culture apart putting them together again in often random, grotesque, improbable, surprising, shocking, sometimes deliberately experimental combinations. But there are certain important differences between the tribal genres, relatively few in number, of liminality, and their prolixity of genres found in modern industrial leisure. I have called the latter liminoid by analogy with ovoid, egg-like, and asteroid, star-like. I wish to convey by it something that is akin to ritually liminal, or like it, but not identical with it. The liminoid represents, in a sense, the dismembering, the sporagamus of the liminal. For various things that hang together in liminal situations split off to pursue separate destinies as specialized arts and sports and so on, as liminoid genres. Furthermore, the liminoid is very often secularized. Many of the symbolic and Luddic cap capacities of tribal religion have, with the advancing div division of labor, with massive increase in the scale and complexity of political and economic units, migrated into non-religious genres. Sometimes they have taken their sacred tone with them, and one speaks of high priests and priestesses of this or that art form or of criticism. Certainly the symbol and ritual have gotten into drama and poetry, while on the other hand, literary critics speak of 19th century 
Blingen Stormen, a story of our hero's progress from poverty to glory, innocence to experience as a rite of passage or an initiation, with a linear, irreversible, monological, diachronic progression. While Julia Kristieva, on the other hand, writes of the carnivalization of the novel, a kind of synchronic, dialogic, non-linear, reversible, multi-gen nerd work such as Robilia Cervantes, Lawrence, Stern, Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and others have produced, which may have its ultimate roots in seasonal rituals of reversal and celebration of fructifying chaos, rather than rituals of status elevation. One striking piece of secularization seems to have occurred after the massive burning of images of the Virgin Mary by Thomas Cromwell in Chelsea in the 1500s. Devotion came by the end of the century to be addressed to, the, to a secular virgin queen, Gloria Ariana or Ariana, Elizabeth I, whom the liminoid artists, the secular poets, and dramatists dedicated their rich symbolic offerings. Other arts have developed quasi-liturgical properties, or alternatively have laid claim to the prophet's mantle. Music, for example, has often been called the religion of intellectuals, while poetry, as Blake and Rimbaud, saw it as the language of the prophet the Voyant. Continuing to contrast liminal and liminoid, we may say that liminal phenomena tend to be collective, concerned with calendrical, meteorological, biological, or social structural cycles and rhythms, or with crises in social processes, whether these result from internal adjustments, external adaptations, or unexpected disasters, earthquakes, invasions, plagues, and the like. Thus, they may appear at what may perhaps be called natural breaks, breaks in the flow of natural social-cultural processes. Liminoid phenomena, on the other hand, may be collective, carnivals, spectacles, major sports events, folk drama, national theater, and so on. And when they are so, they are often directly derived from tribal liminal antecedents, but are more characteristically produced and consumed by known named individuals, though they may of course have a collective or mass effects. They are not cynical, but continuously generated, though in times and places sequestered from work settings in the leisure sphere. Liminoid, liminal phenomena are certainly integrated into the total social process, forming with all its other aspects a complete whole, and its specific essence representing the negativity and subjectivity, subjunctivity of that total process, rather than its positivity in, and indicativeness, its possibility rather than its actuality, its maybe and might have been rather than its is, was, and will be, or even via negativa entered by everyone, not just by the mystics. On the other hand, liminoid phenomena develop most characteristically outside the central economic and political processes, along their margins, on their interfaces, in their tacit dimensions, though later liminoid ideas <coughs> though later liminoid ideas and images may seep from the peripheries and the cornices into the center. They are also, in contrast to liminal phenomena, plural fragmentary and experimental. By fragmentary, I mean the total inventory of liminoid thoughts, words, and deeds. Individual liminoid productions may, of course, be highly coherent because they may be highly coherent because they have been passed, as Ben Jonson said, through the second fire on the Muse's anvil, craftsmanship. Liminoid phenomena, being produced by specific named individuals or particular groups, schools, coteries, tend to be more idiosyncratic and quirky than liminal phenomena, which one generalized and which one generalized and normative. They compete with one another in the cultural market and appeal to specific tastes, while liminal phenomena tend to have a common intellectual and emotional meaning for all members in the widest effective community. Liminal phenomena may on occasion portray the inversion or reversal of secular mundane reality and social structure, but liminoid phenomena are not merely reversive, they are often subversive, representing radical critiques of the central structures and proposing utopian alternative models. 
Another whole set of topics can be spun off of this set of distinctions. For example, the ways in which both liminal and liminoid phenomena constitute meta-languages, including nonverbal ones, devised for the purpose of talking about various languages of every day, in which mundane axioms become problematic, up for speculative grabs, so to speak, where, where the cherished symbols of the forum, agora, and stora are reflected upon, rotated, and given new, unexpected valences. I see the germ of such meta-language and reflexivity in certain of the phenomena of tribal liminality, where we observe parodies of the sacred and eventual mockery of the gods, let alone the chiefs, priests, and patriarchs. Again, I can hardly do more than touch here upon the obvious fact that even in so-called tribal societies, there is an easily recognized liminoid zone of culture. All anthropologists have encountered this. The great wood carvers and painters who produce for delight, as well as ritual occasions, the singers of tales and composers of folklore, the manifold children's games, some of which ironically comment on the practices and beliefs of their elders, the satirists who employ keen and malicious wit to pay put down prigs and bosses, and one another for the delectation of mass audiences. On the other hand, there is a well-marked liminal zone in our own culture, the liturgies and services of surviving religions, the initiation rites of clubs, fraternities, Masonic orders, elk lions, knights of Columbus, secret societies, political and criminal, in the rites of passage of academia, anthropologists will record Meyer Forte's analysis of the Anglican rites by which the atheist Sir Edmund Leach was inducted into the Provost of Kings, or even more celebrated academies. Some will have read Levi Strauss's address after he had been formally and ceremonial, ceremonially admitted as 40th Immortal into the Académie Française, where he compared the rites point by point with those through which he had been given honorary tribal membership in a group of Northwest Coast Indians, thereby calling attention to certain universal symbolic structures in liminal ritual. Furthermore, they, there can be reliminalization of the liminoid. I think this is what may have happened to pilgrimages in the later Middle Ages. Formerly, like all liminoid phenomena, an effect of multiple individual choices and, and arising spontaneously and a counter-thrust to the corruption of ordinary life in the manor and village and town, pilgrimage became built into the structure of Christian culture as a penitential system, as a rite of passage for readmitting criminous and reprobate individuals into the unum ecclesium and indeed into civil society. Again, when a group of liminoid artists const constitutes itself as a coterie, it tends to generate its own admission rights, providing a liminal porter portal into its liminoid precinct, a portal to throw in a liminal monster or two guarded by three-headed dogs and flaming sworded angels. Nevertheless, despite the coexistence of liminal and liminoid phenomena in all societies, it remains true that in complex societies, today's liminoid is yesterday's liminal. <laughs> Here, I will add a few comments on some social and psychological aspects of liminal and liminoid processes. I have often spoken of communitas, or social antistructure, meaning by, by it a relation, of, a relation quantity of full, unmediated communication, even communion, between definite and determinate identities which arises spontaneously in all kinds of groups, situations, and circumstances. I distinguish between three types of communitas. The spontaneous, existential type, which I have just mentioned, the wind which bloweth here it listeth, and which defines deliberate cognitive and volitional construction. Two, normative communitas, the attempt to capture and preserve spontaneous communitas into a system of ethical precepts and legal rules, something akin to Weber's routinization of charisma. Though here, the charisma is Pentecostal, something that descends on a group and is evanescent, rather than a constant personal attribute. And three, ideological communitas, the formulation of remembered attributes of, of the communitas experience in the form of utopian blueprint for the reform of society. Ideological communitas seems already to fall into the class of liminoid phenomena. At the opposite pole to spontaneous existential communitas is social structure, the sense of American and British structural functionalist sociologies and anthropologists. Robert Merton puts it 
as well as any, when he defines structure not as Levi Strauss would as a system of unconscious categories, but as the patterned arrangements of role sets, status sets, and, and status sequences, on the whole consciously recognized and regularly operative in a given society. When we participate in social structure thus regarded, we gain through being presented with an ordinary social world, with a recognized system of social control, with prescribed ways of acting towards people, with a prescribed way of acting towards people by virtue of our incumbency of status roles. But we lose immediacy. We are constrained by laws and conventions. We are usually limited in the degree to which we can play with ideas or innovate behavior. Recognition should be given in this view to the social, to the social is of that rec... Hmm. Recognition should be given, if this view of the social is a valid one, to both key modalities of human relatedness, structure, and communitas, if the social process and personal life are to develop fruitfully and usefully. Hypertrophy or atrophy of either may well produce social conflicts and psychological problems. Repressed communitas may be as warping as sexual repression. Now, one of the social aspects of liminality is probably to produce the optimal conditions in small-scale pre-industrial societies for the emergence of communitas among liminalities, particularly among those jointly undergoing the initiation. The leveling and stripping process I mentioned earlier, the reduction of initiants to a sort of common human prima materia, may have the effect of strengthening the bonds of communitas even as it dissolves antecedent social structural ties. Initiants frequently lose their very names, their previous kinship ties are situationally annulled, similarly their former residential and political connections, but they are often allowed, even encouraged, to form small groups of friends in the seclusion camp, and such ties of friendship often endure, whether institutionalized or not, throughout life. Friends of this type among the Nindimu even act as mediators if there is a blood feud between their respective lineages. Liminality-originated friendship exists in our own society, of course. Members of the same class at Sandhurst or West Point, regardless of national, state, or class origin, continue to meet ceremonially whenever possible throughout life. The same is true of gatherings of alumni on American campuses in the summer, a liminoid time of leisure. So, I am speculating that certain kinds of liminality may be conducive to the emergence of communitas. Again, there is a difference between the tribal liminal and the industrial liminoid. In the former, the whole group is engaged in this process, directly through its representatives. In our society, it seems that the small groups which nourish communitas do so by withdrawing voluntarily from the mainstream, not only of economic but also of domestic familial life. The social category becomes the basis of recruitment. People who are similar in one important characteristic, sex, age, ethnicity, religion, or some aspect of a religion, or the possession of a, of a common physical or mental condition, often pathological, standing in a local community, trade, profession, or so forth, withdraw symbolically, even actually, from the total system, which they then may, in various degrees, feel themselves to be alienated from, to seek a, the glow of communitas among those with whom they share some cultural or biological feature that they take to be their most significant mark of identity. Through the root of a social category, they escape the alienating structure of a social system into communitas, or social anti-structure. This may well be normative communitas only, but there is no doubt if one listens to the enthusiastic members of street gangs, the Lions Club, branches of the women's movement, Catholics for Peace, the new, millen mil min the new Minion movement, rock climbers clubs, poetry readings, and writing groups that subjectively these people have a sense of being at times what Buber would call an essential we, or what David Schneider would call symbolically sharing common substance. Furthermore, in the retreats these, that these groups make for themselves, they generate sensorially perceptible rituals and symbols which frame and consolidate their identity as a communitas. The paradox of such groups is that while existential communitas is a feeling tone, a striving towards the universal, to an open society and an open morality, the normative communitas they achieve often separates them as so many symbolically framed in-groups, even more completely from the env environing society. The social engineering trick, I suppose, is to keep the pipeline open between the society in general and each of its communitas groups, so that the former is seen as an amplification of the latter, and the latter is seen as an organ of the former. 
There are, however, dangers of totalism in which in all in all this which are highly undesirable, the danger of the corporate state, for example. Finally, I want to focus on a concept flow, which has recently been the subject of some fascinating research by a Chicago colleague of mine, a social psychologist, Michal Shum I cannot pronounce his last name. The precise nature of connection between flow and communitas is a question which we shall see. Chusik's Michali stresses the competitive, agonistic frames of flow, while I see communitas as often arising out of the cessation of agonistic processes. In an article in a recent number of Journal of Humanistic Psychology, Flowing, a general model of intrinsically rewarding experiences, Sizik Mikhaili speaks of flow as the holistic sensation present when we act with total involvement, and it is a state in which action flows according to an internal logic, which seems to need no conscious intervention on our part. Sizik Mikhaili Earlier work in the study of play and sport, as he collected many responses from mountaineers, rock climbers, footballers, hockey players, chess players, long-distance swimmers, basketball players, and made his preliminary generalizations about how the state of flow on the basis of these. Now he's extending flow beyond sport to the creative experience in art and literature and religious experiences. Tentatively, he has located six elements or qualities or, or distinctive features of the flow experience. These are... 1. The experience of merging action and awareness. There is no dualism in flow. While an actor may be aware of what he is doing, he cannot be aware that he is aware. If he should do so, there is a rhythmic, behavioral, or cognitive break. Self-consciousness makes him stumble. Pleasure gives way to problem, to worry, to anxiety. The player loses the point, the rock climber slips, the swordsman gets pinked. A personal cavail here. It is not precisely through the effort to resolve such problems of reflexivity. Is it not precisely through the effort to resolve such problems of reflexivity that knowledge advances? 2. In Six Michali's view, this merging of action and awareness is made possible by a centering of attention on a limited stimulus field. Consciousness must be narrowed, intensified, beamed in on a limited focus of attention. Past and future must be given up. Only now matters. How is this to be done? Here, conditions that normally prevail must be simplified by some definition of situational relevance. Bracketing and framing are employed. Sometimes this is by physiological means. Drugs, including alcohol, which do not so much expand consciousness as limit and intensify awareness. I can see some help for this in the study of liminal and liminoid rituals, where social structure is simplified. Elders and jurors, initiants, initiators and initiants, the action may be ritualized. But Shishismeski looks... Shishismikhali... Shishishmikhali... I cannot pronounce his name. I'm so sorry, dead anthropologist. Shishishmikhali looks for his first model in Western games and in sports. There is an intensification... Their, their intensification is brought about by, on one hand, formal rules, and on the other, by motivational means. For example, competitiveness. A game's rules dismiss as irrelevant most of the noise which makes up uncontrolled daily social reality, the multiform stimuli that impinge on our consciousness and sensorium. When we play football or chess, we have to abide by a set of limited a limited set of norms. Then we are motivated to do well by the game's intrinsic structure, often to do better than others who subscribe to the same set of rules. Our minds and wills are thus focused sharply in certain known directions. Rewards for good knowledge and invincible will, when harnessed to tactical skill, compete for Sismikale the focusing complete the focusing, but he is much more interested in the flow induced by these means than in the rules, motivations, or rewards. He believes that this is what makes the participants accept the rules, too, for the sake of, of a flow experience. The participants should also have inner resources, the will to participate. Like other liminoid attributes, this goes back to voluntar vol voluntariness, the, cho the one chooses the play, the capacity to shift and the capacity to ship emphases among the structural components of a game, or to innovate by using the rules to generate unprecedented performances, the sort of thing great co a great coach can do, as well as the players in team games. 3. 
Loss of ego is another flow attribute. The self, which is normally the broker between one's person's actions and another's, simply becomes irrelevant when flow begins. Translating it into, into my terms, the self, Chispichale is talking about, is the broker that functions in the field of the social structural relationships. The non-self or non-mind of flow awareness is highly characteristic of essential communita, of, of existential communitas, as well as what Suzuki would call Zen awareness. For Chismis Kali's game's view of flow, the actor is immersed in flow, he accepts the rules which are binding on other actors, no self in the ordinary sense is needed to bargain about what should or should not be done. Reality, says Chismichale, tends to thus be simplified to the point that is understandable, definable, and manageable. He then insists that this is also applies to religious ritual and artistic performance, as well as to games. Consensus about framing is necessary, if not sufficient, condition for flowing. 4. An actor in flow, says Chismichale, finds himself in control of his actions <clears throat> and of the environment. He may not know this at the instant of flow, but reflecting on it, he may realize that his skills were matched to the demands made of them on them by ritual, art, and sport. This helps him build up a positive self-concept. For outside flow, such a subjective sense of control is difficult to achieve due to the multiplicity of stimuli and cultural tasks, especially, I would hold, in industrial societies with their complex social and technical division of labor. Perhaps there is a similar motivation behind the withdrawal of persons into initially categorical groups based on selected characteristics. I mentioned earlier and I mentioned earlier, and participation in sport. Each helps people to build a positive self-concept in the face of the many-selved protein man of social structure by means of the no-self flow experience. Anyway, it is certain, Chismichale argues, that with control in, say, the ritualized limits of a game or the form of a poem, a person may cope, worry goes, and fear. Even in the rock climbing or Formula One driving, when the dangers are real, the, mo the moment flow is elicited, the activity and the activity is entered, flow delights eliminate the consciousness of danger and of problem. A fifth feature of flow <clears throat> A fifth feature of flow is that it contains coherent, non-contradictory demands for action and provides clear, unambiguous feedback to a person's actions. This is entailed, Jason McCauley says, in the limiting of awareness to a restricted field of possibilities. Culture reduces the flow possibility to define channels, chess, polo, gambling, the stock market, liturgical action, miniature painting, yoga exercises, and the like. You can, confidentially, you can confidently throw yourself into the cultural design of the game or art and know whether you have done well or not when you've completed the round of culturally prefigured acts. In the extreme cases, as in completing the race at Le Mans, if you survive, you have performed adequately. In other cases, the public, the crowd, the audience, or the professional critics have an important say. But if you are a real pro, the final judge is yourself, looking back on your work performance with established criteria in mind. Chismichale shows himself here as being in the classical and not romantic tradition and is stressed on self-imposed limitations or, or accepting the rules of the game. For him, flooding is not flow. Flow is channeled by termable and terminable by fiat. For the true romantic, the formal rules that center attention are only the beginning, discarded when fancy starts to fly. Shelley, for example, in his Lament for Adonis, after Keats' death, used a conventional poetic form to get started, but finds himself fairly quickly driven darkly and fearfully afar to where the soul of Adonis, like a star, beacons from the abode where the Eternals are. The same distinction would probably hold between priestly and shamanic ritual. 6. Finally, flow is autotelic in the sense that it seems to need no goals or rewards outside itself. Culturally, forms such as sports and arts, according to this view, are set up for the sake of the flow and they may induce, not for the particular rewards they may appear to offer, the prizes, trophies, or fame. 
Relating flow to communitas, I would have to say that while I go along with just Macaulay's notion that flow involves a merging of action and awareness, an egoless state that is its own rewards, and that communitas too has these attributes, as he writes in a recent monograph, I do not agree with him that flow requires formal rules and circumscription in space and time as preconditions. Communitas is a sort of shared flow, but it can and does incur both in structured and unstructured situations. On the one hand, any games, sports, artistic performances, musical compositions, poems, and attempts at meditation are totally without flow, frustrating in the extreme to those who have recourse to them who recourse to them primarily for the flow experience. In protracted games, too, the moments of genuine flow are few and far between, even in some regarded as classical and memorable. What the framing of social cultural processes may do, however, is to call attention to the presence of flow, even perhaps to amplify it. But such framing is not necessary for flow production. Flow clearly has strong physiological, including sexual overtones. Flow of milk, flow of semen, flow of blood, flow of urine. There are also metaphorical uses, such as flow of flop thought, flow of ideas, flow of work, flow of production. Flow clearly crosses the work-leisure work divide I spoke of earlier. But in the work domain, itself is heterogeneous and complex and has its liminal aspects. All these uses imply some kind of psychosomatic basis, and, and they imply, too, an endogenous process that has definite beginning and end. This processual form is not imposed, but f from this, this processual form is not imposed from without by rules. As William Blake said of fire, fire finds its own form. So flow finds its own form. Nevertheless, since we are animals with culture, flow elicitation may well be a function of certain key symbols. Again, it is a, it is a matter of particular cultural symbols in concrete situations, not of abstract systems of symbols. Group experiences may lead to the selection of certain symbols as the best flow elicitors. My guess is that these would be liminal or liminoid symbols or symbolic actions, precisely those which are associated with social anti-structure, and which are initially associated with ritual process. These tend to be leveling, frame-breaking, hierarchy-toppling hierarchy sorts of symbols. <clears throat> they may be in the Luddic form of verbal and practical jokes, jokes de mots, witty paradoxes, and so forth, or in the serious form of reference in terms of shared experience of the group to what equalizes us all, the biological facts of birth, copulation, and death, and the troubles of our proud and angry dust, which teased us, which teased us which teach us that we are dust to compound T.S. Eliot's A. E. Hussman and Ash Wednesday litur liturgy. If we focus, for example, on the liminoid genres of literature, on scenes and moments famous for the quality of their communitas and flow, such as Achilles' encounter with Priam in the Iliad, the episode of Resnikolov's and Sonia's long, painful discovery of one another in Crime and Punishment, so well discussed by Paul Friedrich, the communitas of liminary outcasts Lear, Tom, Tom O'Bedlam, Kent, and the Fool in the scene on the heath in King Lear, in the serious vein, the women's communitas in Aristophanes' Lysistra, and many episodes in Tom Jones, Don Quixote, and other carnalized novels. In the Luddic, my hunch is that there, may be, there will be key symbols which open up relationships to communitas, and that, and that in life, too, key symbols will emerge to presage experience, is experiences of communitas. Let me conclude by saying that all societies flow. Symbols are most likely to be found in association with beginnings and transitions, genesis and exodus. In tribal society, they are linked with the liminality of rites of passage and seasonal feasts. In complex, large-scale societies, primarily with the liminoid genres of leisure and flow symbols, often but not always go with the capacity to play, just as in sexuality and lactation, foreplay elicits physiological flow. The study of such transitional processes, processional, liminal, and transformative phenomena will surely help us to loosen up structural anthropology and possibly to desalinate the work process. Hello, in this video I'm going to read excerpts from an essay by Victor Turner called Liminality and Communitas. Form and Attribute of Rites of Passage. Let's begin. In this chapter, I take up a theme that I've discussed briefly elsewhere. I think there's an earlier video that I made of that elsewhere. Note some of its variations and consider some of the further implications for the study of culture and society. 
This theme is in the first place represented by the nature and characteristics of what Arnold von Gennep called the liminal phase of rites of passage. Van Gennep himself defined rites of passage as the rites which accompany every change of place, state, social position, and age. To point up the contrast between state and transition, I employ state to include all his other terms. It is, more, it is a more inclusive concept than status or office, and refers to any kind of stable or recurrent condition that is culturally recognized. Van Gennep has shown that all rites of passage or transition are marked by three phases. Separation, margin, or limen, signifying threshold in Latin, and aggregation. The first phase of separation comprises symbolic behavior signifying the detachment of the individual or group either from an earlier fixed point in the social structure, from a set of cultural conditions, a state, or from both. During the intervening liminal period, the characteristics of the ritual subject to the passenger are ambiguous. He passes through a cultural realm that has few or none of the attributes of the past or coming state. In the third phase, reaggregation or reincorporation, the passage is consummated. The ritual subject, individual, or corporate in a relatively stable is in a relatively stable state once more, and by virtue of this has rights and obligations vis-a-vis -vis others of a clearly defined and structural type. He is expected to behave in accordance with certain customary norms and ethical standards binding on incumbents of social position in a system of such positions. Liminality the attributes of liminality or of liminal personae, threshold people, are necessarily ambiguous since this condition and these persons elude or slip through the network of classifications that normally locate states and positions in cultural space. Liminal entities are neither here nor there. They are betwixt and between the positions assigned and arrayed by law, custom, convention, and ceremonial. As such, their ambiguous and indeterminate attributes are expressed by a rich variety of symbols and in the many societies that ritualize social and cultural transitions. Thus, liminality is frequently likened to death, to being in the womb, to invisibility, to darkness, to bisexuality, to the wilderness, and to an eclipse of the sun or the moon. Liminal entities, such as neophytes in an initiation or puberty rites, may be represented as possessing nothing. They may be disguised as monsters, wear only a strip of clothing, or even go naked to demonstrate that as liminal beings they have no status, property, insignia, secular clothing indicating rank or role, position in a kinship system, in short, nothing that may distinguish them from their fellow neophytes or initiates. Their behavior is normally passive or humble. They must obey their instruction, instructors implicitly and accept arbitrary punishment without complaint. It is as though they are being reduced or ground down to a uniform condition to be fashioned anew and endowed with additional powers to enable them to cope with their new station in life. Among themselves, neophytes tend to develop an intense comradeship and egalitarianism. Secular distinctions of rank and status disappear or are homogenized. The condition of the patient and her husband in, in Isoma has some of these attributes, passivity, humility, near nakedness, in a symbolic milieu that represented both the grave and the womb. In initiations with a long period of seclusion, such as circumcision rites in, of many tribal societies or induction into secret societies, there's often a rich proliferation of liminal symbols. Communitas. What is interesting about liminal phenomena for our present purpose is the blend they offer of lowliness and sacredness, of homogeneity and comradeship. We are presented in such rites with a moment in and out of time, and in and out of secular social structure, which reveals, however fleetingly, some recognition, in symbol if not always in language, of a generalized social bond that has ceased to be, and has spontaneously yet to be, fragmented into a multiplicity of structural ties. These are the ties organized in terms of either caste, class, or rank hierarchies, or of segmentary oppositions in the stateless societies beloved of political anthropologists. It is as though there are two major models for human interrelatedness, juxtaposed and alternating. The first is of society as a structured, differentiated, and often hierarchical system of politico-legal economic positions with many types of evaluation, separating men in terms of more or less. The second, which emerges recognizably in the liminal period, is of society as an unstructured or rudimentary 
voluntarily structured and relatively undifferentiated communitas, community, or even communion of equal individuals who submit together to the general authority of the ritual elders. I prefer the Latin term communitas to community to distinguish this modality of social relationship from an area of common living. The distinction between structure and communitas is not simply the familiar one between secular and sacred, or that, for example, between politics and religion. Certain fixed offices in tribal societies have many sacred attributes. Indeed, every social position has some sacred characteristics, but this sacred component is acquired by the incumbents of positions during rites of passage through which they changed positions. Something of the sacredness of that transient humility and modelness goes over and tempers the pride of the incumbent of a high position or office. This is not simply, as Fortes has co co cogently argued, a matter of giving a, a general stamp of legitimacy to a society's structural positions. It is rather a matter of giving recognition to an essential and generic human bond, without which there could be no society. Liminality implies that the high could not be high unless the low existed, and he who is high must experience what it is like to be low. No doubt something of this thinking a few years ago lay behind Prince Philip's decision to send his son, the heir apparent to the British throne, to a bush school in Australia for a time where he could learn how to rough it. Dialectic in the Developmental Cycle From all this, I infer that in, for individuals and groups, social life is a type of dialectical process that involves successive experiences of high and low, communitas and structure, homogeneity and differentiation, equality and, e and, any, and inequality. Passage from lower to higher status is through a limbo of statuslessness. In such a process, the opposites, as it were, constitute one another and are mutually indispensable. Furthermore, since any concrete tribal society is made up of multiple personae, groups, and categories, each of which has its own developmental cycle, at, at a given moment many incumbencies of fixed positions coexist with many passages between positions. In other words, each individual's life experience contains alternating exposure to structure and communitas, states and transitions. Liminality, low status, and community tasks. We skipped a section because it is not necessary. The time has come now to make a careful review of a hypothesis that seeks to account for the attributes of such seemingly diverse phenomena as neophytes in the liminal phase of the ritual, subjugated autocuthines, small nations, court gestures, holy mendicants, good Samaritans, millenarian movements, dharma bums, matrilineality in patrilineal systems, patrilineality in matrilineal systems, and monastic orders. Surely an ill-sorted bunch of social phenomena. Yet all have this common characteristics. They are persons or principles that, one, fall into the interstices of social structure, two, are on its margins, or three, occupy its lowest rungs. This leads us back to the problem of the definition of social structure. One authoritative source of definitions is a dictionary of the social sciences, Gould and Kolb, 1964, in which A.W. Eister reviews some major formulations of this conception. Spencer and many modern sociologists regard social structure as a more or less distinctive arrangement of which there may be more than one type of specialized and mutually dependent institutions. In the institutional organizations of positions and or actors which they imply all evolved in the natural course of events as groups of human beings with given needs and capacities have interacted with each other in various types or modes of interaction, and sought to cope with their environment. Raymond Firth's 1951 more analytical conception runs as follows. In the types of societies ordinarily studied by anthropologists, the social structure may include critical or basic relationships among similarly arising similarly from a class system based on relationships with the soil. Other aspects of social structure arise through membership in other kinds of persistent groups, such as cans, class, castes, age sets, or secret societies. Other basic relations are due to position in a kinship system. 
Most definitions contain the notion of arrangement of positions or statuses. Most involve the institutionalization or, and perdurance of groups and relationships. Classical mechanics, the morphology and physiology of animals and plants, and more recently with Levi Strauss, structural linguistics have been ransacked for concepts, models, and homologous forms by social scientists. All share in common the notion of a super-organic arrangement of parts or positions that continues with modifications more or less gradual through time. The concept of conflict has come to be connected with the concept of social structure, since the differentiation of parts becomes opposition between parts, and scarce status becomes the object of struggles between persons and groups who lay claim to it. The other dimension of society with which I have been concerned is less easy to define. G. A. Hillary, 1955, reviewed 94 definitions of the term community and reached the conclusion that beyond the concept of people that are involved in community, there is no complete agreement on the nature of community. The field would therefore seem to be still open for new attempts. I have tried to eschew the notion that communitas has specific territorial locus, often limited in character, which pervades many definitions. For me, communitas emerges where social structure is not. Perhaps the best way of putting this difficult concept into words is Martin Buber's, though I feel that perhaps he should be regarded as a gifted native informant rather than a social scientist. Buber uses the term community for Communitas. Community, communitas, is being no longer side by side, and one might add, above and below, but with one another of a multitude of persons. And this multitude, though it moves towards one goal, yet experiences everywhere a turning to, a dynamic facing of the others, a flowing from I to thou. Community is where community happens. Communitas is where community happens. Buber lays his finger on the spontaneous, immediate, concrete nature of communitas, as opposed to the norm-governed, institutionalized, abstract nature of social structure. Yet, communitas is also evident or accessible, so to speak, only through its juxtaposition to, or hybridization with, aspects of social structure. Just as in Gestalt psychology, figure and ground are mutually determinative, or as some rare elements are never found in nature in their purity but only as components of chemical compounds, so communitas can be grasped only in some relation to structure. Just because the communitas component is elusive, hard to pin down, it is not unimportant. Here the story of Lao Tse's chariot wheel may be the opposite. The spokes of the wheel and the nave, i.e. the central block of the wheel holding the axle and spokes, to which they are attached would be useless, he said, but for the whole, the gap, the emptiness at the center. Communitas, with, with its unstructured character, representing the quick of human interrelatedness, what Buber has called das German, 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 might well be represented by the emptiness in the center, which is nevertheless indispensable for the functioning structure of the wheel. It is neither by chance nor by lack of scientific precision that along with others who have considered the conception of communitas, I find myself forced to have recourse to metaphor and analogy. For communitas has an existential quality. It involves the whole man in his relation to other whole men. Structure, on the other hand, has a cognitive quality, as Levi Strauss has perceived. In essentially, it is essentially a set of classifications, a model for thinking about culture and nature and ordering one's public life. Communitas has also an aspect of potentiality. It is often in the subjective mood. Relations between total beings are generative of symbols and metaphors and comparisons. Art and religion are their products rather than legal and political structures. Bergson saw in the words and writings of Prophet the great artist the create of the great artist the creation of an open morality which was itself an expression of what he called the elan vital or evolutionary life force prophets and artists tend to be liminal and marginal people edgemen who strive with a passionate sincerity to rid themselves of the clichés associated with status and incumbency and the role playing and to enter into vital relations with other men in fact or imagination in their productions we may catch glimpses that of that unused evolutionary potential in mankind which has not yet been externalized or and fixed in structure. Communitas breaks in through the interstices of structure, in liminality, at the edges of structure, in marginality, and from beneath structure, in inferiority. 
It is almost everywhere held to be sacred or holy, possibly because it transgresses or dissolves the norms that govern structured and institutionalized relationships and is accompanied by experiences of unprecedented potency. The process of leveling and stripping to which Goffman has drawn our attention often appear to flood their subjects with affect. Instinctual energies are surely liberated by these processes, but I am now inclined to think that communitas is not solely the product of biologically inherited drives released from cultural constraints. Rather, it is the product of peculiarly human faculties, which include rationality, volition, and memory, and which developed with experience of life in society. Just as among the Talensi, it is only the mature men who undergo the experiences that induce them to receive Bacologo shrines. The notion that there is a generic bond between men and its related sen sentiment of human kindness is not epiphenomena of some kind of herd instinct, but are products of men in their wholeness wholly attending. Liminality, marginality, and structural inferiority are conditions in which are frequently generated myths, symbols, rituals, philosophical systems, and works of art. These cultural forms provide men with a set of templates or, mod or models which are, at one level, periodical reclassifications of reality and man's relationship to society, nature, and culture. But they are more than classifications, since they incite men to action as well as to thought. Each of these productions has a multivocal character, having many meanings, and each is capable of moving people at many psychobiological levels simultaneously. There's a dialectic here, for the immediacy of communitas gives way to the immediacy of structure, while in rites of passage, men are released from structure into communitas only to return to structure revitalized by their experience of communitas. What is certain is that no society can function adequately without this dialectic. Exaggeration of structure may well lead to pathological manifestations of communitas outside or against the law. Exaggeration of communitas in certain religious or political movements of the leveling type may be speedily followed by despotism, over-bureaucratization, and other mo modes of structural rigidification. For, like the neophytes in the African circumcision law, Lodge, or the Benedictine monks, or members of a millenarian movement, those living in community seem to require, sooner or later, an absolute authority, whether this be a religious commandment, a divinely inspired leader, or a dictator. Communitas cannot stand alone if the material and organizational needs of human beings are to be adequately met. Maximization of communitas provokes maximization of structure, which in turn produces revolutionary strivings for renewed communitas. The history of any great society provides evidence at the political level for this oscillation, and the next chapter deals with two major examples. I mentioned earlier the close connection that exists between structure and property, whether this be privately or corporately owned, inherited, and managed. Thus, most millenarian movements try to abolish property or to hold all things in common. Usually this is possible only for a short time, until the date set for the coming of the millennium or the ancestral cargoes. When prophecy fails, property and structure return and the movement becomes institutionalized, or the movement disintegrates and its members move into the environing structured order. I suspect Lewis Henry Morgan himself longed for the coming worldwide communitas. For example, in the last sonorous paragraphs of ancient society, he has this to say, A mere property career is not the final destiny of mankind. If progress is to be the law of the future it has been, as it has been in the past, the dissolution of society bids fair to become the termination of a career of which property is the end and aim, because such a career contains the elements of self-destruction. Democracy in government, brotherhood in society, equality in rights and privileges, and universal education foreshadowed the next higher plane of society to which experience, intelligence, and knowledge are steadily tending. What is this higher plane? Is it here that Morgan seemingly succumbs to the error made by thinkers such as Rousseau and Marx, the confusion between communitas, which is a dimension of all societies, past and present, in an archaic and primitive society? It will be a revival, he continues, in a higher form of liberty, equality, and fraternity of the ancient gents. Yet, as most anthropologists would now confirm, customary norms and differences of status and prestige in preliterate societies allow of little scope for individual liberty and choice. The individualist is often regarded as a witch. For true equality between, for example, men and women, elders and juniors, chiefs and commoners, while fraternity itself frequently succumbs to the sharp distinction of status between older and junior sibling. 
membership of rivalrous segments in such societies as the Tallensi, Nuar, and Tiv does not allow even of tribal brotherhood. Such membership commits the individual to structure and to the conflicts that are inseparable from structural differentiation. However, even in the simplest societies, the distinction between structure and communitas exists and obtains symbolic expression in the cultural attributions of liminality, marginality, and inferiority. In different societies and at different periods in each society, one or the other of these immortal antagonists, to borrow terms that Freud used in a different sense, becomes uppermost. But together they constitute the human condition as regards man's relations with his fellow man. Communitas, Model and Process, Modalities of Communitas. This chapter springs fairly naturally from a seminar I ran at Cornell University with an interdisciplinary group of students and faculty on various aspects of what may be called the metastructural aspects of social relations. I was reared in the orthodox social structuralist tradition of British anthropology, which, to put a complex argument with crude simplicity, regards a society as a system of social partitions. Such a system may have segmentary or hierarchical structure, or both. What I want to stress here is that the units of social structure are relationships between statuses, roles, and offices. Here, of course, I am not using structure in the sense favored by Levi Strauss. The use of social structural models has been extremely helpful in clarifying many dark areas of culture and society, but like other major insights, the, culture, the structural viewpoint has become, in the course of time, a fetter and a fetish. Field experience and general reading in the arts and humanities convince me that the social is not identical with the social structural. There are other modalities of social relationship. Beyond all structural lies, not only the Hobbesian war of all against all, but also communitas, a mode of relationship already recognized as such by our seminar. Essentially, communitas is a relationship between concrete, historical, idiosyncratic individuals. And we're skipping. The term limen itself, the Latin for threshold, selected by Van Gennep to apply to transition between, appears to be negative in connotation, since it, no, since, it is, since it is no longer the positive past condition, nor yet the positive articulated future condition. It seems, too, to be passive since it is dependent on the articulated positive conditions it mediates. Yet, on probing, one finds in liminality both positive and active qualities, especially where that threshold is protracted and becomes a tunnel, where the liminal becomes the cuniculus. This is particularly the case in initiation rituals, with long periods of seclusion and training of novices rich in the deployment of symbolic forms and esoteric teachings. Meaning, in culture, tends to be generated at the interfaces between established cultural subsystems, though meanings are then institutionalized and consolidated at the centers of such systems. Liminality is a temporal interface whose properties partially invert those of the culturally consolidated order which constitutes any specific cultural cosmos. It may be useful heuristically to consider the relation to liminality in ritual myth Durkheim's overall characterization of mechanical solidarity, which he regarded as that type of cohesion plus cooperative collective action directed towards achievement of group goals which best applies to small, non-literate societies with a simple division of labor. <clears throat> and very little tolerance of individuality. He based this type of solidarity on a homogeneity of values and behavior, strong social constraint, and loyalty to tradition and kinship. The rules for togetherness are known and shared. Now, what frequently typifies the liminality of initiation ritual in societies with mechanical solidarity is precisely the opposite of this. Ordeals, myths, maskings, mumming, the presentation of sacred icons to novices, secret languages, food and behavioral taboos create a weird domain in the seclusion camp in which ordinary regularities of kinship, the residential setting, tribal law, and custom are set aside where the bizarre becomes the normal, and where through the loosening of connections between elements customarily bound together in certain combinations, their scrambling and recombining in monstrous, fantastic, and unnatural shapes, the novices are induced to think, and think hard, about cultural experiences they had hitherto taken for granted. The novices are taught that they did not know what they thought they knew. Beneath the surface structure of custom was a deep structure whose rules they had to learn through paradox and shock. In some ways, social constraints become stronger, even unnaturally and irrationally stronger, as when the novices are compelled by the elders to undertake what in their minds are unnecessary tasks by arbitrary fiat, and punish severely if they fail to obey promptly, and what is worse, even if they succeed. But in other ways, 
as in the case cited earlier from Van Gennep's rites of passage, novices are also conceded unprecedented freedoms. They make raids and swoops on villages and gardens, seize women's, vituperate older people. Innumerable are the forms of topsy-turvydom, parody, abrogation of normative systems, exaggeration of rule into caricature or satirizing of rule. The novices are at once put outside and inside the circle of the previously known. But one thing must be kept in mind. All these acts and symbols are of obligation. Even the breaking of rules has to, do, has to be done during initiation. This is one of the distinctive ways in which the liminal is marked off from the liminoid. In the 1972 American Anthropological Association meetings in Toronto, several examples were cited, among them the Carnival in St. Vincent in West Indies, the La Havre Islands, Nova Scotia, noted by R. Abrams, from modern, <clears throat> from modern societies on the fringe of industrial civilizations which bore some resemblance to liminal inversions in tribal societies. But what struck me was how even in these outback regions, optionality dominated the whole process. For example, when masked mummers of La Havre, usually older boys and young married men, known as bell, bell snickers, emerge on Christmas Eve to entertain teen and tease and fool adults and to frighten children, they knock at house doors and windows asking to be allowed entrance. Some householders actually refuse to let them in. Now, I cannot imagine a situation in which the Nimbu Lulap the, in which Nidimu, Luvawe, Chokwe, or Luchanzi mass dancers, people I have known and observed, would emer who emerge after the performance of a certain ritual marking the end of one half of the seclusional period and the beginning of another in the circumcision ritual known as Mukanda, and approach the to dance in, in villages and, and threaten women and children would be refused entry. Nor do they ask permission to enter, they storm in. Bell snickers have to ask for treats from householders. Makishi, maskers among the Nindimu, etc., demand food and gifts as of right. Optation pervades the liminoid phenomena, obligation the liminal. One is, all, one is all play and choice and entertainment, the other is a matter of deep seriousness, even dread. It is demanding, compulsory, though indeed fear provokes nervous laughter from the women, who, if touched by the makashi, are believed to contract leprosy, become sterile, or go mad. Again, Saint Vincent, in St. Vincent, only certain types of personalities are attracted to, to the carnival as performers, those whom R. Avrams, the investigator, describes as the rude and sporty segment of the community, who are rude and sporty whenever they have an opportunity to be so, all year round, hence can, aptly, and hence can most aptly personify disorder versus order at the carnival. Here again, optation is evidently dominant for people do not have to act invertedly, as in tribal rituals. Some people, but not all people, choose to act invertedly at the carnival. And the carnival is unlike a tribal ritual in that it can be attended or avoided, performed or merely watched at will. It is a genre of leisure enjoyment, not obligatory ritual. It is play separated from work, not play and work lodigery as a binary system of man's seriousness serious communal endeavor. Abrams, in his joint paper with Bauman, makes a few further valid point, which firmly places Vincentian carnivals in the modern leisure genre category, when he stresses that it is overwhelmingly the bad, unruly, macho-type men who choose to perform carnival inversions indicative of disorder in the universe and society, people who are disorderly by temperament and choose in many extra-carnival situations and choice in many extra-carnival situations. To the contrary, the tribal ritual, even the normally orderly, meek, and law-abiding people would be obliged and disorderly in key rituals, regardless of their temperament and character. The sphere of the optional in such societies is much reduced. Even in liminality, where the bizarre behavior so often remarked upon by anthropologists occurs, the sacra masks, etc., emerge to view under the guise of at least collective representations. If there ever were individual creators and artists, they have been subdued by the general liminal emphasis on amenity and communitas, just as the novices and their novice masters have been. But the liminoid genres of industrial art, literature, and even science, more truly homologous with tribal lim liminal thinking than modern art. Great public stress is laid on the individual innovator, the unique person who dares and opts to create. In this lack of stress on individuality, tribal liminality may be seen not as the inverse of tribal normativeness, but as, as its projection into ritual situations. However, this has to be modified when one looks at the actual initiation rituals on the ground. I found that among the Nindibu, despite the novices being stripped of names, profane rank, clothes, each emerged as a distinct 
distinct individual and there was an element of competitive personal distinctiveness in the fact that the best four novices in terms of performance during seclusion in hunting, endurance of ordeal, smartness in answering riddles, cooperativeness, etc., were given titles in the Reichs marking their reaggregation into profane society. For me, this indicated that in liminality is secreted the seed of the liminoid, waiting only for major changes in social cultural context to set it growing into the branched candelabra of manifold liminoid cultural genres. If one has to, like Tom Thumb in the English nursery rhyme, pull out a dialectical plum from each and every type of social formulation, I would counter that the I would counsel that the investigators who propose to study one of the world's fastest disappearing tribal societies should look at the liminal faces of of their rituals in order, most precisely to locate the incipient contradiction between communal, anonymous, and private distinctive modes of conceiving principles of sociocultural growth. That was a mouthful.